for the privilege that we have to worship you today. God, let our minds be focused on how awesome, how limitless, how boundless you really are. God, let our problems, let our difficulties, let our worries and concerns, God, fade into the light of your glory. Let us see, God, that you're sovereign. You have everything under control. Lord, just as we worship you today, Lord, soften our hearts to receive what you want to speak into our lives. And God, we just give you praise for all that you're going to accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Say to the 
mountains. Amen? Amen. Faith as small as a grain of mustard seed. And that's not very big, but it can produce great things when we put it in God's hands. Amen? Amen. We come into your presence to sing a song to you.
again. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to talk about this morning. Jesus came for us, which is what Palm Sunday is all about, isn't it? He came to us the first time to accomplish what the Father sent him to. He is coming again, just as sure as he came the first time. Jesus is coming again soon. And his question to us is, will we come to him? Will you come to him? Palm branches and cloaks lining the path. Fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that Israel's king would come to them riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Shouts from the crowd that would gather saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Hosanna in the highest. Jesus came for us on that Palm Sunday, entering into Jerusalem. And when he entered into Jerusalem, he knew full well uh, what he was going to be doing. Um, he would be taking our place on a cruel cross in just a few days as he entered into Jerusalem. Just as sure as he fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies about his first coming on that Palm Sunday, he will very soon fulfill the prophecies regarding his second coming. He will very soon uh, be, be here to, to, to judge sin once and for all. When he comes again the second time, it won't be meek and mild and riding on the back of a donkey, but instead he'll be on a war horse to execute final judgment for sin. And um, as believers, we ought, we're, we're awaiting that time, aren't we? When is God going to make right all the injustice, all the sin that's in the world? Will you come to him? Will you be a fully devoted follower, accepting the it is finished work that he accomplished at Calvary, worshiping him wholeheartedly and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and Hosanna in the highest, or will you become an object of his wrath when he comes at the second coming to judge those who have rejected his plan of salvation. The choice is really ours. I don't know about you, but when I think about the story in Matthew 21 of Palm Sunday, I think there may have been some people in the crowd, just like today, who were just crowd followers, don't you? They heard a few people begin to shout out these phrases that were from the Old Testament prophecies, and they may have just joined in because that's what was popular at the moment. But don't you think God can discern who really belongs to him? I think the Bible tells us that. And so it's not just that we do the Christian thing and we say hallelujah and amen at the right times. It's that our hearts are really set on who Jesus is. And I believe that's what the Lord wants to speak to us about this morning. Look at John chapter 6. We're going to read uh, verses 35 through 40. John chapter 6, starting at verse 35. It says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Verse 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I want us to see in this passage four truths I believe God is wanting to show us in these verses, verses 35 through 40. And these are all talking about coming to Jesus, aren't they? He came for us on Palm Sunday. He's coming again. Will we come to Jesus? And that's what the invitation is in these verses that we just read from John chapter 6. Four truths. Number one, come to Jesus because only he can satisfy. Have you found that to be true? Only Jesus can really satisfy. And that's what verse 35 that we just read was talking about. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the one who can satisfy that, that longing, that craving that desire down deep within you, only Jesus can satisfy. We should come to Jesus simply because of who he is. Amen? Not just because of what he's done. He's done some incredible things for us. But because of who he is. That's why we should come to Jesus. He is the bread of life. It's exclusively Jesus who can fulfill the deep desires of our spiritual lives. It's not fame. It's not fortune. It's not friends. It's not fun. It's not fantasies. It's Jesus. Amen? And there's a lot of our friends. There's a lot of our loved ones. There's a lot of people in our society. That's what they're chasing after. To try and find fulfillment and satisfaction. They're seeking after fame and fortune and friends. Fun and fantasies. And they're coming up empty. 
But Jesus wants to fill us. He wants to satisfy our hearts if we'll come to him. Listen to this quote. People eat bread to satisfy physical hunger and to sustain physical life. We can satisfy spiritual hunger and sustain spiritual life only by a right relationship with Jesus Christ. No wonder he called himself the bread of life. But bread must be eaten to sustain life. And Christ must be invited into our daily walk to sustain our spiritual lives. So Jesus is telling us, I'll, I'll be your sustenance. I'll be your daily bread. As the Lord's Prayer talks about, if you'll look to me, I am the bread of life. What will result from us partaking of Jesus, the bread of life? He says in, the, in verse 35, we shall never hunger and we shall never thirst. Isn't that a pretty good promise? In our spiritual lives, we shall never hunger and we shall never thirst. Look at Isaiah 55, one of my favorite books of the Bible, Isaiah Chapter 55, verses 1 through 3, it talks about the fact that we will never hunger, we'll never thirst if we look to the Lord, if we come to the Lord as our, as our provider, as our, the one who will satisfy. It says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. This promise was to Israel, but it's to us, the body of Christ, today as well. Not every promise that was made to Israel is available to us, necessarily, as a church. But God is saying, if we'll come to him, why do we waste and squander our resources on things that don't satisfy? If we'll come to him, we can buy wine and milk without price. The spirit of God, his working in our lives, the spiritual provision that Jesus made available to us through his finished work at the cross. We need to delight ourselves in his abundance. Amen. Not the world's so-called abundance that's here today and gone tomorrow that withers quickly. We need to trust the Lord. He wants to make an everlasting covenant with us. The sure mercies of David if we'll look to him. If we'll partake of Jesus, the bread of life, we'll never hunger and we'll never thirst. He'll satisfy that deep longing in our hearts. People who keep coming to him and keep believing on him will never be cast out. The key is we must stay where? In Christ. In Christ, we will never hunger we will never thirst. Why is it that we end up hungry sometimes in our spiritual lives or thirsty and parched and dry? It's because we get outside of Jesus. But God the Father is always going to bless His Son, Jesus. And so if we keep coming to Jesus, we keep believing on Him, we're in Christ, we're never going to be hungry, we're never going to be thirsty, we'll never be cast out. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. 1 John 5. Starting with verse 11, it says, And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Alright, so if we want to never hunger and never thirst, if we don't want to be rejected or cast out by God the Father, then it, it tells us in these verses we need to have who? Jesus. Amen. We need to be hidden in Christ. And we will have the blessings that God intended for us to be living in. Listen to this quote. There is a hunger in the heart of man which cannot be satisfied by other things. Man was originally created in the image of God. As such, he is a spiritual being, definitely not the product of mindless evolution. However, in his fallen state, man has cut himself off from God, who alone can satisfy this hunger. And don't we see it every day in our neighborhood? in our schools, on our jobs, people who have cut themselves off from their Creator, from God, and then they wonder why they're, they're lacking. They wonder why in their spiritual lives they're, they're empty. And uh, it's because they've cut themselves off from the one who can only, the only one who can satisfy that hunger and that desire in their hearts. So we need to point people back to Jesus. We need to point people back to God and show them that He is the bread of life. He can provide uh, for every need in their life, if they'll look to Him, if they'll come to Him. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Most of us can probably quote this from the King James. I want us to see it in the Amplified, and it's up on the screen as well. 
It says this in the Amplified Bible, Matthew 5, verse 6, one of the Beatitudes. It says, Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. What a promise, isn't it? What a promise. We're blessed. We're enviably happy is what the word blessed means. We're fortunate. We're prosperous in Jesus to the point where if we hunger and we thirst for righteousness, for God's righteousness to clothe us, we will be completely satisfied. If we hunger and thirst after righteousness, the King James says, we shall be filled. And so we need to trust the Lord to be our provision. We must come to Jesus, keep on coming relentlessly. And really in the original language, when it says those who come to him and those who believe, the actual original language of those two words is those who come and keep on coming. Those who believe and keep on believing. It's not just one time when we were five and we prayed a little prayer that we came to Jesus. We as believers ought to be coming to him to the foot of his cross every day saying, Jesus, thank you that you've given me everything I need for life and godliness. We need to keep believing in him relentlessly every day. We must come to Jesus, keep on coming relentlessly. We must believe on Jesus and keep on believing relentlessly. And that's where Satan will attack us. He's wanting to test how relentless we are in our faith. We must hunger and thirst relentlessly for all that he has for us. And then these verses say we shall be filled, satisfied, and complete in him. Let's let our faith be fierce. Amen. And it's going to be tested. Genuine faith is faith that is tested. But we can know that if our faith is in Jesus Christ and his finished work, it's going to, hold, it's going to pass the test. Amen. He is faithful and he's going to do what he uh, came to the cross to accomplish. Number two, this morning, the second truth uh, we can see in verse 36. Come to Jesus and get rid of the unbelief. All right? Come to Jesus and get rid of the unbelief. It says in verse 36, But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And those of us who are believers were like, How in the world can someone have a revelation of who Jesus is and what he's done for us at the cross? and not believe in him because we surrendered our lives to him but jesus is saying that he was saying this to some of the religious people of his day he's saying that there are some of you who've seen me you've seen the miracles you've seen me even raise lazarus from the dead but yet you still do not believe how is that possible we would think but you know what there's two silver bullets of satan our enemy you know what those are the bible tells us it's pride and unbelief Pride and unbelief. Pride can be thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to, but pride can also be having just the wrong opinion of ourselves. We can be thinking lowly of ourselves and a little pity party for ourselves, and that can still almost be a reverse kind of pride. We're not believing what God says about our life. That can be pride and unbelief, which is what was going on here. And he's telling us, get rid of the unbelief. Coming to Jesus requires Getting rid of both pride and unbelief. Not allowing the enemy to infiltrate our lives with those two silver bullets. What all we have seen in our lifetime. What all have we seen? We think about how many church services we've been in. We think about how God has revealed himself to us in our lifetime. What have we seen about who Jesus is? How has God time and time again revealed himself to us in our circumstances? Through preachers at church or in Sunday school or through a prayer meeting or a Life Connection Bible study. God shows himself to us, doesn't he? He reveals himself to us. After all that we have seen, how can we allow unbelief to settle in in our lives? Yet sometimes it happens, doesn't it? We allow unbelief to settle in. Too many today are believing a lie instead of coming to Jesus and believing in him. They're believing the lie that a day at the lake or that camping trip well, that fishing trip at 11 Mile will do us more good than coming and spending time in God's presence at church. We're believing that lie. We're believing the lie that the work of our own hands can accomplish more than doing the will of our Heavenly Father by the help of the Holy Spirit through the finished work that Jesus did for us at the cross. We're believing the lie, and we need to get rid of unbelief. Listen to this quote. In the matter of choice, which all men have, 
God doesn't violate our free will, does he? He doesn't violate our choice. Every one of us has a choice. Why would people have such a revelation of Jesus and not believe it's by their own choice? In the matter of choice, which all men have, Satan pulls heavily upon the individual, attempting to keep him in his deception. However, the Holy Spirit also moves mightily upon the individual's heart. Aren't you glad? The Holy Spirit's fighting fiercely for us as well. At least when the word of God is proclaimed, overriding the powers of darkness, helping man to see himself as he truly is, and Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. And so we need to pray for those people who are bound up in unbelief. Maybe they're unsaved. Maybe they're saved. There's some of both, I think, going on in the world today. And we need to pray, God, help them to make the right choice. Help them to discern what is the enemy trying to steal from them, the blessings that God has for them, and what is the Holy Spirit's voice trying to lead them into truth, into real life, and help them to make the right choice. Because God's not going to violate our free will. But if we choose to come to Jesus, He's not going to cast us out. He's going to fulfill the longings of our heart, and we need to share that with those around us. Jesus couldn't do very many miracles and good works in His hometown. You remember that from the Gospels? In His own hometown. Why? It was because of their unbelief. Because they would not believe God. What hinders Jesus from pouring out His Spirit, performing signs and wonders in these last days right here in Colorado Springs, in the Pikes Peak region? I think it's the same thing, don't you? It's unbelief. We have a lot of churches, we have a lot of religious organizations that even label themselves as Christian, but yet we still have a lot of unbelief. We're not believing God for what He says and wanting what He wants. Let's come to Him every day with faith in His finished work at Calvary and let's not let pride and unbelief rob us of the things that God has for us. Number three, from this passage in John 6, we can see that we don't have to fear being cast out if we come to Jesus on his terms, which is through the cross. That was God's terms, right? Verse 37, from the Amplified, it says, All who my Father gives and trusts to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will most certainly not cast out. I will never, no, never reject one of them who comes to me. All right? Some people sincerely believe that if they were to come to church, that the building might cave in on them. You know some folks like that? I do. I've worked with some folks like that. It felt like, oh, I hear your invitation, but I'm afraid I've done too, too many bad things. The building's going to cave in on it. God might strike them down with lightning because they've gone too far. Their sin is too bad. And, uh, but this verse tells us, doesn't it? That's not true. He says, all who will come to me on his terms. We can't come our own way. We have to go by way of the cross and true repentance, renouncing our sins. But if we come that way, God says he won't reject any, anyone who comes in that way. Many people use these verses in John 6 that we've used as our text today to, to justify um, you know, unconditional eternal security. And that's not what this is talking about. God says we still have to come His way. We can't do our own thing. We have to go His way. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the, in the next few verses. Revelation twenty two seventeen, it says this, And the Spirit and the Bride say what? Come. The Spirit and the Bride say come. Let him who hears say come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. And Jesus is the one who is giving us the water of life, His truth, His Spirit in our lives. God's asking us to come to Him, not just once at salvation, but every day to position ourselves in His presence. Listen to this quote. Satan makes many people believe that they have done so bad that Jesus will not accept them. Of course, he knows how to build his case step by step, as he is a master of accusation and condemnation. So regrettably, Many have died eternally lost because they believed a lie. The truth is Jesus will accept anyone, underline, bold-faced, circle it. Jesus will accept anyone who comes to him as long as it's on his terms, which is by way of the cross of Christ, and they keep on coming. That's how we continue to grow in our walk with the Lord, isn't it? We said a prayer. We gave our hearts to Jesus. For me, it was when I was five. I came to the cross and said, God, I need your forgiveness. I repent of my sins. I, wanna, I want you to be my Savior. But I have to keep on coming, don't I? To the cross, to grow and to mature. And that's what we have to do. And God says He will accept anyone who comes to Him in that way. 
And so we need to tell people it's by way of the cross. It's coming to God on his terms. They don't have to fear being cast out. God wants to welcome them in. And though Hollywood may show in all the movies that God's ready to throw lightning bolts at us every time we make a mistake, that's not God's nature. That's not his character. He loves us. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. And we need to share that with those around us. Number four, the last point we can see, the last truth we can see in this passage this morning. By coming to Jesus, we accomplish the will of the Father in sending Jesus. All right, verses 38 through 40. It says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, this is Jesus speaking, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. So what does God expect of us? What Jesus demonstrated is, is <clears throat> excuse me, isn't that what God expects of us? <clears throat> he doesn't expect of us anything that Jesus didn't live out by example before us and before mankind. Not doing his own will, but doing the will of the Father by the help of the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? Right before, the night before his crucifixion. He said, Father, and he said he was sweating drops of blood over the intense pressure of the moment, which that's what Gethsemane means. Gethsemane was a wine press, a place of pressure. And then Jesus cried out to, to his heavenly Father, um, God, not my will, but yours be done. If this cup of suffering can pass from me, may it be so, but not what I want, God, but what you want, your will. If this can happen, the salvation of mankind some other way, and God let it happen. But if not, God, not my will, but yours be done. And that was Jesus' heartbeat. And God wants us to have that same heartbeat. If we come to Jesus with that heart attitude, not my will, but Lord, yours be done, we can be used greatly and powerfully by the Lord in these last days. And that's what God's looking for. Some people who will say, God, it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. He's looking for some churches who will say, God, it's not about what we want. It's about what you want. Your name being lifted high. All right? We talked about eternal security. These verses really bring it out. And this is the passage that a lot of people who believe uh, in eternal security talk about. You know what we believe as finished work worship center? You look at our doctrinal statement, Assemblies of God people, uh, Pentecostals. A lot of Pentecostals have the same statement of faith that we do. We believe that we're eternally secure. Do you know that? We believe. John 10 talks about no one can snatch us out of God's hand. We believe God's word. That's true. We're eternally secure. We don't jump in and out of our salvation every time we commit an act of sin. Did you know that? That's an extreme Arminianism. We don't believe in that either. We don't believe in extreme Calvinism, though, that we're unconditionally eternally secure. We're eternally secure. No one can take us out of God's hands, not even the demons in hell, Satan himself, can steal our salvation. We're eternally secure. We're just not unconditionally eternally secure. As these verses tell us, we have to keep on coming to Jesus. If we stop coming to Jesus and we reject the cross, we reject Jesus after we've already been saved, we can lose our salvation. Not like we lose our car keys, but by our choice. We say, God, I don't want anything to do with you. And that's not an easy choice, especially if you've really been saved. But Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that we can become an apostate, meaning that we once believed and had salvation, but we walked away from it. So we're eternally secure, but that doesn't keep us from, from walking away from God. We've got to keep on coming, and we've got to keep on believing in Jesus if we're going to keep on having everlasting life. And that's what verses 38 through 40 really say. Listen to this quote. Just as shipwrecked men looking at a lifeboat and trust themselves to it, for salvation and are surely brought to land. So guilty sinners looking upon the Lord Jesus, committing themselves by faith to him, enter into a position of safety and are made certain of being brought to the resurrection shore. And if we've trusted the Lord, we've put our faith in what he did for us at the cross. When we die, we have a hope that we're going to be talking about a whole lot next week about the resurrection. He's going to go and prepare a place for us, John 14 says. And if he, if he goes and prepares a place for us, he's coming again and he might receive us unto himself. But will we keep on coming? Will we keep on believing so that we can enjoy the end of our salvation, spending eternity in heaven with Jesus, with God? That's what his desire is. Look at Romans chapter 6. 
We're going to close with this passage this morning, talking about uh, coming to Jesus and seeing the, the will of the Father accomplished in our lives. Romans 6, starting with verse 3, it says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This isn't talking about water baptism. This is talking about what water baptism symbolizes, but this is talking about us being immersed. We're identified with Jesus. When he died on the cross, our old nature, if we accept what he did for us there, our old nature died with him. Does that make sense? We were baptized. We were immersed into his death, which is what water baptism represents. But that's not exactly what this is talking about. It's talking about being baptized into his death. If we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we were identified with Jesus in his death, we were immersed in what he went through. Our old nature died with him when he died. Then we also have a hope of resurrection. Isn't that awesome? Of newness of life. He's not going to leave us dead and in the grave. He's going to raise us up into newness of life to be the kind of people he wants us to be. Not controlled and dominated by our sin nature, but divine nature controlling us. The Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So God's telling us, through what he did for us at the cross, he, cross, he accomplished the Father's will. What was the Father's will? That we die to our old sinful nature and be raised into newness of life. That's what Jesus made available to us by his perfect example. Amen? That's what he came on Palm Sunday to accomplish. Jesus is coming back soon for those who will believe and keep believing in him. Jesus is coming back soon for those who will come and keep on coming on his terms to him by way of the cross. And we need to make a decision. God, I'm going to come and keep on coming. I'm going to believe and keep on believing. And I'm going to bring as many people with me as I can so that they can receive the life so that they can receive that newness of life that you've purposed for us through the cross and become the people of God that you want them to become. Amen. God wants us to come to him. He came on that Palm Sunday. They waved their palm branches and laid their cloaks before him, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But how many really came and gave their hearts to him? Will we come to him today and make sure that we're ready for his second coming when he comes back for his church when he comes back to judge sin god wants us to examine our hearts would you stand with me this morning i want us to close a time of prayer we're going to put a song on in just a moment and then have a, a time of prayer this morning is as we close if you come to jesus renouncing your sins and asking his forgiveness through his sacrifice on the cross making him the master over everything in your life. Maybe everybody in this room has done this, but maybe someone listening to this on our, our, our website or on a, a, a CD later on, God's asking you today, have you renounced your sins? Have you asked his forgiveness? Have you uh, accept, accepted what he did for you at the cross and said, Jesus, I want you to be the master over everything. I want to relinquish control of my life to you and give you control. That's what God's asking of us today. Will we come to him? John 3, 36 says, He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not believe the Son will not see life, but the wrath, the anger of God rests over him. And so we need to make sure that God's anger isn't resting over our lives because we refuse to repent of our sins. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself on the cross. Remember that? It got dark in the middle of the daytime. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took God's wrath upon him so that you don't have to be judged because of your sins. And if you'll give those sins to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. 
I don't want to live in a way that's not pleasing to you anymore. God will forgive us. We don't have to have God's anger, God's wrath hanging over our heads. We can have newness of life, walk in a daily personal relationship with Jesus. So if that's where you're at today, God wants us to surrender. But most of us here this morning, I believe, are fully devoted Christ followers. We're trying to live for Jesus, to be the people that he wants us to be. How do you allow the circumstances? Maybe you've allowed the busyness of life to cause you to forget that only Jesus can fully satisfy. It's easy to do, isn't it? To get so busy, to get so caught up in the, our daily routine and circumstances that we forget that only Jesus can satisfy. As we close in prayer, we spend some time with the Lord this morning. Maybe the Lord just wants to remind you he can satisfy. You will never hunger. You'll never thirst if you'll just come to him. Do you need to rid your life of some unbelief that has creeped in? Maybe something that God told you years ago, years ago he was going to do and you haven't seen it happen yet. You know, remember Moses' life and um, the things that God told Moses, the things that God told many of our patriarchs, told Abraham he's going to have a son. And it was a long time before that promise came to be, but God will fulfill his promises. Maybe there's some unbelief that we've allowed to creep in that we need to lay before the Lord and ask his forgiveness for this morning. Do we need, to, we need God to calm our fears about being cast out? You know what? In Christ, we will never, ever, ever be cast out. So we need to stay positioned in Christ. It doesn't matter what the church, our denomination, or religious world says about us. It matters what Jesus, the righteous judge of all the earth, says. Maybe our church cast us out, or maybe our family believes differently, differently than we do, and they've cast us out. God says, I'll never cast you out if you come on my terms through, through the cross in Christ. Are our hearts and minds set on accomplishing the Father's will by the help of the Holy Spirit like Jesus did? Praying, not my will, but yours be done. If that's not where our heart's at, maybe we've been chasing worthless pursuits or something that's all about us. Maybe we need to say, God, help me to get to that place where I can say, not what I want, but God, what you want. Let's make that our hearts cry this morning. Jesus came and he's coming again soon. Will you simply come to him? Will you position your life before him and allow him to do a deep work in your life? I want us to put this song on, Hosanna. And as this song plays, I want you just to find a place of prayer. If you want to kneel at your seat there, if you want to come forward, you can. But let's seek the Lord for just a few minutes as this song plays. And however God wants you to respond to him, every time God speaks to us, every time he wants a response from us, and I believe this is a message the Lord is speaking to us today. What's the response that he wants from you? Let's give our hearts to him, and then we'll close together in just a few minutes after this song.
let's stand this morning. Let's close together in prayer. The last part of that song, I think, is really the heart of what we're trying to say as a response to God. It says, heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. And let's let that be our prayer. God, not my will, not what I want. God, not what we want is finished work worship center, but God, what you want. Let it happen. And as we go into our Easter services, Sunday, this coming Sunday, let's say, God, what you want to happen. I believe God wants souls to be saved. Amen. I believe he wants people to be delivered and set free and to hear about him even for maybe the first time. Say, God, what you want. And let's ask God, what do you want? And God, how do you want to use me this week so that what you want can happen on our Easter services? Let's pray for our revival services coming up. God, what you want um, would happen. Heal us, deliver us, set us free. Let there be breakthrough. And I believe God wants to do some powerful things. So let's close in prayer and uh, give God our, our, um, our hearts this morning. Let him do what he's wanting to do. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you, Jesus, that you came meek and mild and riding on a donkey the first time to be our, our substitute, to take our place on the cross, to take the anger and the wrath of God upon yourself so that we could be free from the dominion and the power of sin and we can be the people that you want us to be saved and ready for heaven. God, we thank you for that. Thank you that you're coming again for your church very soon at the rapture to take us home to be with you. Those who have come by way of the cross, renounced their sins, repented of them, and turned to you. Jesus, you're going to bring us home very soon. And Lord, we're looking forward to that. Lord, we believe that just as sure as you came the first time, you're going to come at the second coming. And Lord, you're going to bring judgment once and for all for sin. And God, we're not the objects of your wrath if we've been saved. But God, those in the world who have rejected you, who have rejected the finished work of the cross, they're going to be the objects of your wrath. And God, I pray that we'll not be smug or, or happy about that. But God, I pray it would move us with compassion, Lord, to reach out to people that don't know Jesus. During this Easter season, God, help us to realize there's so many who really don't have an adequate understanding of who you are and what you've done for their lives. And God, let us look even this week for opportunities to share our faith to point people to Jesus, to show people they need to come to you. God, you are the bread of life. You will satisfy that hunger and that thirst in their lives. God, help us to have divine appointments where we can encourage people to come to you and to see, God, that you're not going to cast them out, God. You want to receive them into your open, loving arms, God. You want to change them, God, from the inside out and make a difference in their life. God, help us to point people to you. God, to show them that. God, help us as believers, to, to do the Father's will by the help of the Holy Spirit. Help us, God, to lay aside what we want and our selfishness and our selfish ambition. And God, to find out what your heartbeat is, what you want. God, it's about souls. It's about your kingdom being advanced. God, not our kingdom. God, help us to lay down our pride and our unbelief and to allow you to move as you desire to in our lives. God, I pray for Finished Work Worship Center, God, that you would lead and guide and direct us God, help us to be the church that you want us to be in Colorado Springs and the Pikes Peak region. God, I pray that we'll see a great harvest of souls next Sunday on our Easter services. Draw people to the house of God. Let there be an interest in God. Let there be souls saved. Let there be lives delivered and set free and healed. God, let there be a powerful move of your spirit. And God, use us as your hands and feet this week to see that happen. God, we just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the revival services coming up on the 27th. We pray for a, a heavy anointing upon Renee Moore as she prays and seeks your face about what you'd have her to preach, how you'd have her to minister. God, I just pray for breakthrough. I pray for a Holy Spirit outpouring, God, in those services. God, that we'll just be propelled forward as a church and in the things that you have for us in this year of 2014. God, we're believing you for great things. God, help us to keep on believing, to keep on coming, and to see, God, you uh, working your plan in our lives. We thank you for that. Lord, as we leave this place today, keep us close to you. Help us to be sensitive to the voice of your Holy Spirit, sensitive to the needs of others around us this week. God, just use us as instruments in your hand, we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen, amen. God bless you.